Hello, I hope you are very well. Today I wanted to do a different kind of video for me. I'm sure you know the booktuber Ankali. She only started her channel last year, but she is already so massive and I have obsessively watched all her videos because she is hilarious and also incredibly thoughtful and intelligent about the way she reviews books. But she is best known for her videos where she reads three of the favorite books of famous people, generally influencers or actors, or just popular people at the moment. I love watching these videos because they have the perfect combination of indulging in the lives of famous celebrity people while also being really insightful reviews of some really interesting books. So I was thinking I could do something similar but instead of reading famous people's favourite books I could watch famous people's favourite films. Finding lists of favourite films of people I'm interested in anyway which is generally actors has proved to be a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Typing into Google such and such names favourite films generally comes up with a list of the films they themselves have been in that someone has ranked on some film website. Luckily Rotten Tomatoes has done a whole series for several years now where they've interviewed actors and other people in the film industry to ask them about their five favourite films. So that has given me at least a little bit of material to start with. So today I thought I would start off with one of my favourite actors and generally the internet's favourite actor Saoirse Ronan. She is of course best known for starring in Lady Bird and Little Women, both directed by Greta Gerwig. Those two films are probably the ones to make her uber famous, but she has been acting since she was a small child back in Atonement. Saoirse Ronan is a famously very private person and doesn't have any social media, but the one thing I did know about her from watching interviews with her is that one of her favourite films is Bridesmaids, which made me have the opinion that she might be a little bit basic in her film tastes, in that I think Bridesmaids Bridesmaids is a kind of basic choice, but then I'm really not much of a fan of that American style of comedy. But this interview she did with Rotten Tomatoes has provided a lot more variety in films. The interview was done in 2014, so she was 20 years old at that time. So I wonder whether she might pick different films now. So I have picked three that I haven't seen before that I'm going to watch and afterwards I will review them. The first one is On the Waterfront, which is a famous film starring Marlon Brando. I've been meaning to watch Marlon Brando films for ages because I've only seen him in Godfather and then recently watched him in Guys and Dolls where he actually sings but obviously he's most famous for A Streetcar Named Desire and On the Waterfront so I've been meaning to get around to watching those for a long time. One of her other picks in that Rotten Tomatoes article was Three Amigos, a comedy with Steve Martin and Martin Short. This is one of those films where I've seen the poster like in Blockbuster back when I was a kid but Steve Martin is one of those comedians that I've never really got. However, I did watch Martin Short in a film called A Simple Wish, which is a kids film with Mara Wilson from the 90s. I actually really enjoyed that and I think Martin Short is quite funny, so it will be interesting to see whether I laugh at this one at all. And finally, this isn't from the Rotten Tomatoes article, but something she mentioned in an interview that I watched with her, which is Jules et Jim. And this is a Francois Truffaut French film from the 1960s. Truffaut is obviously an incredibly famous director that I've heard about, but never watched any of his films. So I feel like this is a good opportunity to broaden my horizons. So I will come back after I have seen them and give a full review of what I think.
so I have now watched all three films and I'm going to go through what I thought about them. As a whole, I have to say Saoirse Ronan has a great diverse taste. Just going off these three films, they're all so different from each other and all very striking in their own way. Even though I didn't love all of them, I certainly wasn't bored by any of the films. It's just started raining outside. It's meant to be spring, but we've been granted some fall weather in the Southern Hemisphere, which I'm actually not unhappy about because it's the beginning of October. So I'm trying to pretend that I can also be part of the Northern Hemisphere fall movement for a little while. Anyway, so the first film I watched was Jules et Jim. And in the film, they actually say that the character whose name is Jim likes it to be pronounced the English way rather than the French way. This is a 1962 film directed by Francois Truffaut. It is a French film. It definitely feels very typical of the French New Way film era. I haven't seen a huge amount of films from that era because the ones I have seen, I haven't loved them. I have seen Breathless, which is probably the most famous one. And I've seen A Woman is a Woman, which stars Anna Karina, which is the French actress who's probably best known now because Alexa Chung was obsessed with her. And I wasn't that fussed about that one either. So it hasn't driven me to watch more French New Way films. But this one I really enjoyed at the beginning. It made me sort of think about how obviously there's a reason French New Wave became popular in English-speaking countries, particularly America and UK obviously. And if you compare the style of these films to what was being made in the UK and America at the time, they're so vastly different. The French films as kind of over the top as the storyline can be. The way that actors are actually performing and interacting with each other is so much more natural than the very stagey way that people were acting still in English speaking films at the time, although obviously the 60s was the time when films started to move away from the very staged films of the earlier Hollywood era. So it was interesting in that respect because I think I sort of finally understood why French films became so famous and why they would have been so popular for young people at the time who were looking for something different from what their parents had grown up with. In terms of the story, it's based on a novel and it follows these two friends, Jules and Jim, and they're having a lovely time at just kind of hanging out with each other and hanging out with a bunch of women. Presumably they must be quite wealthy because they don't seem to do any work aside from trying to be writers. They meet this woman, Catherine, and they both kind of fall in love with her, though she ends up marrying Jules. And then World War One happens and both men have to go out to fight. And because Jules is actually Austrian, he's forced to fight with the Germans and Jim is fighting with the French. And so that whole experience changes the three characters drastically and really changes their relationships with each other. As I said, I quite enjoyed the beginning of the film. It was just kind of a fun hangout movie and it is so interesting to see people from such a long time ago acting relatively naturalistic. It feels like you get a real insight into the everyday lives of people, well at least rich white people, from a different era. And it feels like an insight not just into the setting of the film, the early 1900s, but the 60s as well, because I think all films can't help but be influenced by the time that they're made in, especially the way Catherine looks. As much as they try and put her in period clothing, she looks so fully 60s. Putting World War One in the middle is a really great way to frame the story and force the characters to grow up. Presumably the person writing the novel was actually basing it on real experiences as well. And obviously a lot of stories are about the loss of youth and innocence because of the two world wars. But I felt like the film really descended into melodrama about who Catherine was going to pick, the bizarre way these characters act and their excuses that they're in love with each other. I didn't really get why they were behaving in the way that they did. It all seemed really weird and over the top and unnecessary. I wouldn't say the film is necessarily bad, it just wasn't going in a direction that was engaging me. I did also really hate the ending. It was so abrupt and because something huge happens and then it just suddenly ends, you kind of left feeling a bit lost and unsure of how you're supposed to be reacting to that. I'm glad I watched it. It was interesting and I always love watching films that I might might not necessarily pick myself, but I certainly couldn't say that I enjoyed it as such. Next, I watched Three Amigos. This is a film starring Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short. And the three of them play Hollywood actors in the early 1900s who are famous for their characters, the Three Amigos, where they wear traditional Mexican clothing and defeat bandits and rescue women. However, in real Mexico, a village is suffering from the attacks of a real bandit and one of the women of the village sees the Three Amigos films thinking that they are real 
and sends them a telegram asking them to come and help the village. There's a miscommunication and the three actors think that they've been asked to come and do a performance and so of course comedy ensues from that misunderstanding. This is a 1986 comedy and any comedy that was even made before the last few years there's always a danger of it being offensive, particularly so in the 80s I feel, and seeing three white men dressed in traditional Mexican costume on the poster is hardly promising for a film that's going to live up to the standards of now. Comedies just naturally age so fast. It feels like what we find funny changes more rapidly than any other type of genre, which is definitely not a bad thing. And to add on to that, comedy might be one of the most subjective genres. I find very few comedy films that funny at all from the ones that I've seen. I haven't seen a lot because there's not much worse than sitting through a film that's meant to be funny that you find nothing funny about. There's a lot of TV shows that I find really funny, but I have been thinking about this recently and I think this is because it's a lot easier to sustain laughs over just a half hour compared to 90 minutes. Comedy works best in brevity, I feel. So anyway, I was very concerned about offensive jokes in this film and I was really pleasantly surprised to find that there weren't any obvious ones at least. There's obviously something inherently problematic with the conceit of the film. Some of the characters might verge on stereotypes but I feel like for its time especially it did really well. You certainly feel that the makers of the film were not in any way making fun of Mexico or Mexican people they were truly making fun of these Hollywood actors and their idiocy. Every Mexican character is thankfully played by Latinx actors because the brown face threats were very real and thank god did not happen in this film. I definitely wouldn't say I found it that funny. There were a few little jokes that I kind of laughed at, mostly from the other characters and not from the three main characters I have to say. Aside from Martin Short, in this film he's so innocent and nice that you just want to protect him from everything and so I did find some of his jokes quite funny because I think it's so rare as well to have someone who is being sweet and lovely be comedic because comedy in the mainstream I feel often comes from being mean and making fun of people or being cynical. So honestly I feel like watching Martin Short kind of got me through this film because I think without him I would have been quite bored. But I did end up having quite a nice time by the end of it. It does play more as an adventure story with some comedy rather than a comedy film like I was expecting. So I think that helps when there's a proper storyline that runs through it. So lastly I watched On the Waterfront, a film from 1954 directed by Elia Kazan. This is obviously a very famous Marlon Brando film. He plays a dock worker who is mixed up in a corrupt dockers union. He witnesses a murder and feels guilty because he was unknowingly setting the guy up to meet his end and feels especially guilty when he meets the guy's sister who he of course falls in love with as well. I can absolutely see why this is a classic. It was a very well done film. It's so atmospheric. All the acting is amazing. You're just so fully immersed in this world. And Marlon Brando is so excellent as this character who's not exactly the brightest, but has this sense of goodness about him that differentiates him from the people around him and makes the romance between him and this young woman who has been sheltered from it by being away at school, it makes that believable and very real. I had no idea about the history behind this film until I read up on it afterwards and so apparently this director was very caught up in McCarthyism which I actually never knew what that really meant but that actually means people who would accuse other people of being communists with no proof at all and also who really cares whether people are communists anyway. And so the film kind of takes the angle that jobbing on people can be for the greater good. And within the context of the film, it does make sense because he is jobbing on these corrupt people who are making the lives of poor workers miserable. And so by doing this, he is helping the workers to have more agency over their work. So it works fine watching it as a film, but the director using that to try and prove why him dobbing on people and calling them communists is okay makes it totally wrong and really awful. And so apparently Elia Kazan was really good friends with the playwright Arthur Miller and Arthur Miller was so disgusted by what Kazan did and disliked the way he was trying to justify himself through this film that he wrote The Crucible in response as an example of why witch hunting on any form is abhorrent. So now I really want to watch The Crucible because I feel like that's a necessary 
strange balance that needs to happen now. It's so interesting setting films within their context and reading about why they were created in the first place. That's like half the reason I love film. I obviously do love watching films and being immersed in a totally new world, but I also just as much love afterwards going on IMDb. Sometimes if the film's bad, it's more enjoyable to read about it afterwards. And in this respect, it can totally change your opinion of a film because before I was thinking, yep, great film, good message. And now knowing that backstory, I really have to separate in my brain the film as itself and the context. I'm so obviously very glad I watched it because it is such a famous film and it was one that I definitely had to watch eventually. So as a whole, what do I think these films say about Saoirse Ronan? I think they say that she is very much a film buff, very into her classics, but not obvious classics. These are, I feel, maybe more indie classics, certainly Jules at Gym and On the Waterfront are well-known films, but not the biggest films. And with The Three Amigos, I do know that she likes SNL type humour, which makes me think we have very different tastes in humour. They're definitely relatively mainstream choices, but on the indie side of mainstream, if that makes sense. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was interesting. Please let me know because I have a few other celebrities in mind that I want to do more of these types of videos on. If you know of any celebrities who have talked about their favourite films, let me know in the comments because it's really surprisingly hard to find lists like this. thought it was going to be a lot easier. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye!